Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. Uh, my name is Stefano Carrera. I am the correspondent for the Italian Economic Daily newspaper, is Sole 24 Ore. And let's start this session. We have today a special guest. Uh, no need for long presentation. You all know him. He's the former Prime Minister of Japan, Naoto Kan. He led the government for uh, around 15 months in 2011. And uh, it was the year of the great earthquake and tsunami, so he had to deal with the, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear crisis. This book is uh, the German translation of uh, his book on uh, his experience in dealing with the crisis. And uh, in a couple of months, it will be available the English translation of uh, this uh, book. So he left the job after securing the approval of a new legislation uh, aimed at promoting the alternative energies. And after that, he became a leader in the campaign against nuclear power in this country. And strangely enough, on this issue, he found himself on the same camp uh, with another former prime minister, Yunichiro Koizumi. So kind of informal alliance against the nuclear power. And uh, the current government, of course, uh, ignored their appeal. And uh, one nuclear plant already has uh, restarted in this country. Uh, so uh, now let's proceed. And uh, first of all, uh, turn uh, your mobile phone on, on a manner mode. And uh, please extend a warm welcome to the former Prime Minister of Japan, Naoto Kan. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm very uh, honored and happy to be invited here to the FCCJ after some time since my last visit. As uh, was introduced just now, I was the Prime Minister of Japan from June 2010 for 15 months. And of course, it is needless to say that during my time as Prime Minister, the earthquake and subsequent Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster, which occurred on March 11, 2011, was the most significant thing to happen during this time. And of course, this was a time of uh, great confusion following the accident, where it was very difficult to have accurate information, which is an issue I'm sure uh, most of you were dealing with at this time as well. Of course, now we are aware that following the earthquake, which occurred at 2.46 p.m. on March 11, just around three and a half hours later than this, at around 6 p.m., was when the meltdown experienced. And then later on that evening, at around 10 p.m., was where the hole was developed, leading to a melt through in the reactor. And of course, if this nuclear fuel had actually, uh, as after this melt through, been released to outside of the container vessel, we would not even be here in Tokyo today. And of course, the fact that this did not occur is uh, to a great extent thanks to the efforts on site of those from TEPCO, the police, and the self-defense forces who were dealing with the situation. But not only this, also to a great range of coincidences which occurred at the time, which I believe was almost through the protection of God, which meant that we are still able to be here today and that Tokyo did not have to be evacuated at that time. Until March 11, I myself also believed in the very uh, strong skills and technical expertise in Japan in the nuclear industry, so I did not believe that it would be possible for such a disaster to occur. However, through this disaster, I learned that my belief at that time had been completely wrong. And I changed my beliefs by 180%. And I came to believe or understand that to get rid of nuclear power plants would be for the benefit of the Japanese people, for Japan as a whole, and indeed for the world. And since ending my time as Prime Minister, I have de dedicated my efforts to this purpose. I have been invited to many other countries by people who are working against nuclear power in their own communities. And three of these places have actually since uh, gone towards the step of moving away from nuclear power or decommissioning. One of these places was in the United States uh, to the San Onofre, San Onofre nuclear power plant in California. This was planned to be restarted very soon and I was invited to speak at a symposium there together with the former US uh, NRC chair, Mr. Yazko. We had this symposium together and actually just two days later than this, the company responsible for the nuclear power plant, San Onofre, San Onofre the company Edison, declared that it would decommission the plant. And the second was Taiwan, where I was invited to speak at various events in relation to the planned uh, number four nuclear power plant there. 
And the number four nuclear power plant in Taiwan was almost completely constructed at that time, actually. However, a decision was made soon after this uh, to have a moratorium until the next presidential election so that this nuclear power plant would not go into operation, at least until then. And the third example is our next door neighboring country, actually, Korea, and the site of the Kodi nuclear power plant near the city of Busan. There was a discussion at the time about whether the lifespan or the lifetime of the nuclear power plant should be extended from 30 to 40 years. And we had very many symposiums and so on in relation to this. Following this, a dis decision was made not to extend the lifetime of the Kodi plant, and actually it is moving now towards decommission. As you are aware, here in Japan on April, uh, August the 11th, the Sendai nuclear power plant in Kagoshima Prefecture was restarted. Actually, in Japan, in the time immediately after the March 11 Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster, 25 of the 54 nuclear reactors in Japan were under operation. And following this, of course, the other nuclear power plants in Japan gradually did uh, were shut down in the time following this, but the only one which was uh, shut down as a result of a direct political request was the Hamaoka nuclear power plant run by Chubu Electric. And this was a result of a request which I made during my time as Prime Minister on the 6th of May 2011, due to the fact also that Hamaoka is located in a very earthquake prone area, uh, made a request to the operators Chubu Electric to shut down the plant. And the shutdown of the other nuclear power plants in Japan was a result of them either going into regular maintenance, uh, planned regular maintenance, or also as a result of the fact that the standards for restart, which I set during my time as Prime Minister, were made much stricter than they had been in the past. And prior to the March 11 disaster, the conditions for restart was being set by whether they would uh, fit the standards of NISA, the Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency, which was located within METI. And it was almost taken as a given that they would approve the restart according to their own uh, internal standards. Uh, uh, soon after I shut down the Hamaoka nuclear power plant, METI announced that it was moving towards restarting the Genkai nuclear power plant in Kyushu. And at the time when I asked who had the authority to decide upon the restart of the nuclear power plant, I was told by the METI minister at the time that it was NISA alone that would make this decision or give the approval. However, uh, I did not believe, or I strongly believe, that we should not allow the decision about restart to be left alone only up to NISA, who was not able to prevent the accident at Fukushima. So I put in place temporary standards for restart, or conditions for restart, and there were four elements to this. The first being the requirement for uh, local community approval, or local uh, authority approval. The next being the approval of NISA, or soon to be the NRA. Next being stress tests. And the fourth condition being approval by the Prime Minister and four central ministers or four ministers of the appropriate uh, ministries at the time. And as a result of these new rules which are standards which were put in place, it meant that except for uh, one specific exception, all of the nuclear power plants which went into nuclear, oh, sorry, regular maintenance after this time could not be restarted because they did not fit these new standards which were put in place. The one exception for this was uh, the OE nuclear power plant under the Noda cabinet when the Kansai Electric Company or KEPCO at the time was saying that if this was not restarted there would be very severe electricity shortages and so this was the one exception. And so following this, because of the difficult conditions which were put in place which were obstructing the restart of the nuclear power plants, the uh, utilities or the electricity related industry and METI uh, started to feel that if I were to continue as Prime Minister, these obstacles would be so much in place that it would be too difficult for them to restart the nuclear power plants, meaning that they went into very strong political or extreme political efforts to end my time as Prime Minister, in other words, to bring me down. I would like to speak some more about this a little later on. Next, I would like to speak about the restart of the Sendai nuclear power plant. So the restart of the Sendai nuclear power plant was a result of the judgment being made that, they, that it did meet the conditions which were set in place for restart by the NRA, which was newly established as a law under the DPJ after my time as Prime Minister in regards to new regulation requirements. However, even the chair of the NRA himself, Mr. Tanaka, acknowledges that the NRA does judge whether the nuclear power plant does meet the new uh, regulation or conditions, standards which are being put in place, but it does make no judgment about whether there are sufficient evacuation plans in place for local residents. Within the new guidelines which were set up by the NRA in regards to response in the case of an accident, uh, one of the conditions in place is that the local authorities within 30 kilometer area of the nuclear power plant must put in place uh, evacuation plans for the citizens or residents. 
However, in the case of the Sendai nuclear power plant, the governor of the Kagoshima prefecture and also the prefectural uh, government or council, as well as the local authorities in the government and the mayor of Satsuma Sendai have given their approval or were in favor of the restart of the nuclear power plant. However, this is not necessarily the case for the heads of the local governments in the other parts which are within this 30 kilometer zone. And the Abe government as well uh, is not shaking the full responsibility of, while the initial evacuation is the responsibility of the local government, the long-term evacuation responsibility, of course, lies with the national government. However, the Abe administration is not taking the responsibility for this. And so I believe that restarting the nuclear power plants amidst this situation where the responsibility in regards to evacuation is still unclear is something which from a legal perspective as well, according to the laws in place for uh, response in case of a nuclear disaster, is something which is unacceptable. For example, in the United States, the R NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, has the responsibility of actually checking and verifying evacuation plans for residents in nearby areas and giving approval about whether these plans are sufficient or not as part of their responsibility in the, as a regulatory body. However, in Japan, this is not the case. Uh, as I mentioned, due to my efforts of calling for the shutdown of the Hamaoka nuclear power plant and also increasing in the strictness of the regulations and the standards for restart of the nuclear power plants, since immediately after this there were very uh, severe efforts to bring me down as a prime minister. And at the front line of this in terms of the politicians involved was the current prime minister, Mr. Abe. And for example, just around two weeks after I called for the shutdown of the Hamaoka nuclear power plant on May 20 of 2011, Mr. Abe, who was then a member of the Diet, called in his uh, mail magazine or his newsletter sent out via the internet. He mentioned in an article there that on March 12, 2011, I, being the Prime Minister at the time, had called for the injection of ocean water into the Reactor 1 at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant to be stopped. And so he therefore said that I, as Prime Minister, was responsible for the disaster response being delayed so much and that I should step down immediately. And four days later in his mail magazine newsletter, which was sent out on May 24, he called for a notice of lack of or no confidence vote to be made against me as Prime Minister. And on June the 2nd, actually, uh, giving the reason that my response as Prime Minister was not uh, sufficient or was, uh, had been wrong, the LDP did, in fact, submit such a notice. And within the Democratic Party or the DPJ, there were, of course, various movements in response to this. And we were able to uh, have a majority vote against this proposal. However, of course, the political situation continued. And with this as one of the large reasons in the background, uh, I ended my time as prime minister in September of that year. However, Diet member at the time, Mr. Abe, the comment he made in that I had called for the water injection to be stopped on March 12th was based on completely false information. There was no evidence and no such case of this happening. And uh, TEPCO itself does uh, show within their reports announcements shows that the injection of water was continuing throughout this entire time. And I did not make any such request for this to be stopped. And since two years ago, I am actually within the courts uh, having a lawsuit against Prime Minister Abe for defamation in regards to this. And I am calling for, of course, the or this claims made by Prime Minister Abe were kept on his homepage, on his mail magazine online, without being deleted for the entire time after this. So the two things I have been calling for first is for that to be deleted from the internet and second for a public apology. However, Prime Minister Abe has consistently refused both of these requests. However, uh, after much time had passed, actually, well, two years after the event, uh, without making any contact either to the courts or to me, uh, Prime Minister Abe actually unilaterally deleted this information from his homepage without making any comment about this deletion. And so, of course, this means that, well, he was, in a way, acknowledging that the information which was being posted there had not been correct. However, he has not responded to my request for a public apology in regards to this. And I expect that a judgment in regards to this suit will be made within this year, but I just wanted to share an update on this situation with you all today. And within the final remaining time of my presentation today, I would like to speak about something with a little more hope. I firmly believe that by the end of this century, not only will nuclear power plants throughout the world also be no longer, but we will also no longer be using fossil fuels by this time. Of course, this year in Japan, we had a very hot summer, but despite the fact, or at the peak time when people were using air conditioners and so on, when demand was at its highest, we had no electricity shortage. 
And one of the significant reasons for this is because of the expansion of solar power generation in Japan. Solar power, of course, generates the most during the daytime when the sun is out, which means that it is able to cover the demand at the peak time. And I think this had or was very much part of the reason why we were able to meet, uh, go throughout this summer without electricity shortages. In the United States and Europe also we see the number of nuclear power plants decreasing and at the same time rapid increase in generation through renewable energy such as wind, solar and biomass. China is the country which is at the moment uh, having the greatest uh, increase in nuclear power plants. However, even in such a place, even in China, the generation of electricity through nuclear power plants is actually being uh, or overdone or there is more generation through renewable energies now, through wind. We are also seeing great global developments and also new innovations in regards to efficient use of electricity and energy throughout the world. And so I believe that Japan also has both the technology and also the capacity for such industries, for such developments in renewables as well. So I really believe that it is very important for us now not to go backwards towards nuclear power once again, but to have a forward shift towards renewable energies. And this would be for the benefit of the Japanese economy and also the safety of the Japanese people. And I also believe that even if we look just at the financial aspects of nuclear power, in the end, it does not make sense. So hereby I will end my initial remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan. And uh, thank, thanks to our interpreter, Mary Joyce. So let's start the Q&A session now. First, uh, the members of the press. Any questions? My name is Crowell from Nuclear Intelligence Weekly. I, so that I can get this accurate, would you please tell us again what it, what it does that Mr. Abi accused you of on his website? I have, I have copies of his blog here, actually, here in the text, so I'm happy to give that to you in Japanese. So I have just done, delivered a copy of the actual original uh, text by Prime Minister Abe. To, to put it very simply, the main point which was included is that on March the 12th, so the day after the disaster, from the uh, initial beginning of the injection of uh, water from the ocean at 7.04 p.m., uh, he claims that I became very angry saying, I have not heard about that being done, you need to stop it straight away, is the claim being made by Mr. Abe of what I as Prime Minister had said. However, in reality, and this is also acknowledged by TEPCO, uh, this did not happen and the plant managers also acknowledged that from the beginning of the injection of water, it was not stopped once throughout the time after that. It was consistently being injected after this. So there is no evidence at all of me making a request or of it actually being stopped. Um, there is also many other points which he is including in the article, but that's the, the main point which I would like to share. Um, and the day after the newsletter or the online newsletter was sent out, on the top page of the Yomiuri Shimbun, the newspaper, the next day, so on March 20, sorry, May 21st, the top headline of the article saying, because of the Prime Minister's wish, the water injection was stopped. And this is the example of the Sankye newspaper of the following day, so of May 21 as well. And it is not the top article, but it is on the top page of the Sankye of that day. And the headline reads, Prime Minister extremely angry interrupts the injection of water. And so within this comment, or within the article, both in the Yomiri and the Sankye, they are reporting directly from Prime Minister Abe's newsletter, and also with his comments included as well, saying the same thing again. However, just one week after, on May 27th, uh, this is an example of the Asahi Shimbun, the newspaper. However, all of the other newspapers did make the same reporting following an announcement by TEPCO saying that the injection of water had continued without interruption throughout that whole time. So this was just one week later. It was shown that actually there was no request and there was no interruption of the water injection. And this was uh, across the board in all of the newspapers at that time. Yes, I'm sure we are all curious about the outcome of the lawsuit by a former prime minister against the current prime minister. So. Uh, 
My name is Shiobara. I am an associate member here at the club, and I have two questions. First of all, for former Prime Minister Khan, in regards to the restart of nuclear power plants, if you were to name a particular nuclear power plant, which definitely should be not restarted, uh, which would this be, and the reason for that? And the second, uh, which is on a completely different question, but in regards to the uh, reshuffling or the rearrangement of the opposition party, I would like to ask, what are your plans within the DPJ for this, and what are the steps in line there? Thank you. In in regards to the first question, of course, in Japan, for close to the past two years, there was not a single nuclear power plant operating throughout the country. All of the plants had been stopped. And yet we did not see any significant uh, minus or, being, or damage being brought upon either the Japanese economy or the everyday life of the Japanese people within this time as well. Therefore, I believe that all of the nuclear plants should not be restarted and they should instead be gradually moved towards decommissioning. The biggest reason of this, well, of course, there is the risk of disaster, but not only this, there is also the issue of spent fuel. Here in Japan, we still have not come to a decision about how to deal with the issue of spent fuel in the long term as well. And thus, I believe that restarting the nuclear power plants without figuring out what to do with this spent fuel is also uh, definitely not the best thing to do when we consider what is needed for the future as well. So from the perspective of what is best for Japan's future and also best for its economy and also the safety of its people. People, I believe that restart should not occur. Also, we have not seen any significant economic uh, minuses, shall we say, uh, from this, and we will not. And actually, it would be the opposite. If we were able to make such a decision, then we could end the, or the wasteful investment which is now being put into the nuclear power plant industry and instead shift this towards investment into renewable energies and so on. And this would actually be, uh, in the long term, a much better economic decision also. And in regards to the second question about the opposition, I believe that the most important point at the moment is not so much looking at the situation within the existing opposition parties in Japan, but whether it is possible to have collaboration which goes beyond this into creating kind of with a new movement, for example, whether there could really be the capacity to overcome these current existing uh, situations and create a new party, for example, which would go beyond this. As some of you may be aware, before entering the political sphere or before becoming a politician myself, I was involved in various civil society level activities in Japan. And this led to the involvement in the creation of a new political party. Especially now we are seeing the situation in the public or here in Japan surrounding the security bills or so-called war bills. And here we are seeing, for example, the emergence of SEALD, the young teenagers or 20-something year olds movement, which has not maybe traditionally been participating or active in politics, but now being very active and very vocal as well. Or also other groups which had not traditionally been very vocal or active in such uh, activities such as uh, young mothers, for example, or women joining these activities as well. I believe when we look at the fact that these people who are being involved is not coming from, shall we say, the traditional movements of the labor unions or uh, students groups coming from within various sects and so on, we are really seeing a much broader level of people within Japan being engaged in politics. And so the most important question now, I believe, when we are looking at what kind of opposition uh, should take place in Japan is whether these new movements and this new energy will be able to give birth to some kind of a new step within politics in Japan as well, and whether it will be possible to work together with such movements, with such developments taking place in Japan to become a center to form a real strong opposition as, for example, a new party in that respect. My name is Kurt Sieber. I'm an associate member. Um, I'd like to come. <clears throat> I'd like to come back on your last point about the cost of uh, nuclear power. Um, I had the chance to see the movie "Tell the Prime Minister" the other day, and also I will have the pleasure to hear you speak again at the OAG on uh, September 16. I was one of the first ones to have a solar system on top of my house and I sold and I sold the electricity to, to TEPCO at 48 yen uh, per kilowatt. Also the system was uh, very heavily subsidized by the central government, central government uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Government and Setagayaku. This was a very good thing, but it gave in the world and in Japan the mistaken impression that solar power is very, and renewables are very expensive. 
the mistaken impression. The long-term strategy in the United States, um, where I have several connections, is that uh, solar and wind power will come to about five or six cents in mega systems in the future. Now, if you take the cost, <laughs> in the interest of time, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the question. Don't worry. On the other side, nuclear power, we have the cost and the possibility of final storage. We have the possibility of uh, the the cost of decommissioning. If you add all those, uh, even not considering the accidents. The, the cost of nuclear power, if you really calculate it in economical terms, is a lot, lot higher than uh, what uh, uh, renewable energies will be uh, in the future. So I'm, I'm greatly supporting your view that um, at the end of the 21st century, uh, nuclear power will naturally disappear because it is too expensive. However, however, by that time we will not be alive. So what are we going to do in the meantime? And I think the original policy, which, uh, which and I, I would like to hear about uh, from you from, um, about that, is the original policy of the um, TPJ was to um, phase out uh, nuclear energy in the 1930s, latest by 2040. Um, I'm Swiss and also in Germany, um, nuclear power is being phased out. But it is phased out about a, uh, uh, well, over a reasonable period of time, whatever that re uh, period will be. So I have one problem with your, uh, with your uh, policy, and there I would like to hear more from you, is what are we going to do until 2030 or 2040? Is it really a good idea uh, to phase out totally immediately? Um, because most of the fossil fuels which are being used, uh, the, uh, particularly in Japan, uh, it's fossil fuels and it's coal which has a much more uh, important destruction of environment and uh, pollution. So please tell us what you think about the next 15 to 25 years. Thank you. So when you talk about 48 cents, you must have made your solar panels at a very good time, I believe. So was your initial investment covered within about five to six years? In regards to the feed-in tariff, or as a result of this, we are seeing great increases in the amount of solar power being generated. There is also perhaps an image that comes along with this in some ways about uh, an increasing cost of electricity as well. And there is, of course, various uh, you know, advertising efforts and so on in place to put forward this image. However, I would like to say uh, that this image is not necessarily accurate. Um, until the feed-in tariff was introduced, there were various subsidies in place for the introduction of uh, such efforts as well. However, it was not clear at the time whether uh, that would actually be returned or not, which meant that as a result there was not a significant increase in uh, the amount of renewables being generated. And within the tariff setting within the FIT system, uh, there is actually, it has been put in place or the tariffs are being set as a way to uh, make certain that the installation fees can be fully recovered within this, or almost in a way to guarantee this. And through this being included as part of the FIT, this has meant that uh, there is a great increase in the number of people who have chosen to be involved or engage in solar. And within, of course, the example of the 48 yen as well, this is not guaranteed for a permanent uh, price setting as well. There is, you know, four within, uh, you know, 10 and 20 years and so on, deadlines being put as part of this also. And this year, for example, it has actually decreased to 29 yen per uh, kilowatt. And so what is the reason for this uh, decrease in cost, shall we say? Well, of course, one of the main points is that the installation costs are much less than they had been previously as well. Therefore, the amount that needs to be guaranteed to recover these costs required for installation is much less than it had been in the past. And of course, the FIT is in a way an incentive for the initial 10 or 20 years to promote the introduction of solar, to promote the introduction of such energies as well. 
We see, for example, Germany introduced such a system around 20 years ago and has shown great success within this policy. And I believe we are also seeing this here in Japan as well since the introduction. And this is re leading to a great increase in the amount of solar, for example. I believe if we look another 10 to 20 years from now, we might even see that the costs of solar will actually decrease so much that it may be around the same level or even cheaper than natural gas. And when it comes to this point, there will actually be well, no need anymore for such a system such as the FIT system to, to continue to be in place at that time. However, at the moment, we are seeing great success as a result of this being introduced. And in regards to the question of until when we should continue to use nuclear power plants or what the the short-term plan for that would be. If we look at the example of Germany, the decision has been made to have zero nuclear power plants by 2020, and currently I believe there are nine operating in Germany. And immediately after the disaster here in Japan, I was also concerned about whether if all of the nuclear power plants were immediately stopped, whether there would be blackouts and shortages. However, we have seen for approximately two years in Japan there was no nuclear power plant operating and even now it is only the one at the Sendai nuclear power plant. And yet within this time we have not seen any significant uh, negative effect on economic activities here. So and also when we consider the issues of spent fuel and storage, I am also sharing the same opinion that you mentioned that in fact nuclear power is not cheaper than other forms of energy but actually much more expensive when we include these within the factor. And if we look at the examples, for example, of Spain, where we see uh, renewable energy is um, filling about 40% of the energy being generated, for example, or the goals which are being put in place in Germany to have 80% of energy, including uh, heat or thermal through renewable energies by the year 2050. I believe that if Japan were to put in place the same kind of goal as Germany, it would be very much possible for Japan to meet such a goal by this year. So for example, to have 80% uh, renewables by the year 2050. So this really shows, and I very firmly believe, that there is no need to continue utilizing nuclear power. And uh, I heard that also Mr. Khan started generating uh, solar energy in his house. So uh, I wish to ask, can you confirm that you are selling energy to the TEPCO? And uh, don't you feel a sense of vindication in this selling energy to TEPCO? Actually, around two years ago, uh, I am living together with my mother, actually, and we rebuilt our house, first of all, to make it, uh, as we say, barrier-free for her. And also, upon uh, my wishes, also making sure it was a uh, home which would consume very little energy, so very energy-efficient uh, home as well, so including not only introduction of solar, but also ways to generate through gas, even, within our own home. And so if I calculate, for example, the last year or so, the 12 months of last year as well. So as I mentioned, I'm living together with my mother who's 94 years old, so quite elderly, meaning that during the winter, for example, she is using the floor heating and utilizing quite a lot of electricity within the home. If we uh, calculate or put together the gas and also the electricity including what we are buying from TEPCO, I'm actually selling around the same amount back to TEPCO through what we have generated in our home as well. So I can say they're actually now a very good customer to me. Uh, hello, Joël Lejean from uh, French Radio and Television, RTL TV5. Um, at the end of the year, in December, we're going to have the Climate Conference in Paris. And until um, uh, 2014, Japan has been, because of the stopping of nuclear plants and the import of a lot of gas and oil, one of the major emitters after the US and, uh, and China, the third one, actually, until 2014. So what is your expectation about this um, conference in, uh, in New York, do you th in Paris? Do you think that uh, if... Bureaucrats, government officials, NGOs, and so on are very um, interested by this conference. It doesn't seem to be the same for the uh, companies, chairman, and uh, firms who don't have really much interest into targeting uh, their activities with uh, limitations in a, in, a, in a way to to to, to uh, not to pollute too much. What do you think about this conference, and what do you think Japan should do on this issue? Uh, in regards to COP or the conference coming up, I believe that the uh, change in a way of the stance of both the United States and China in a more positive direction is something that I'm paying great attention to at the moment. And so if we compare to, for example, the time of the conference in Kyoto, we saw both of these countries uh, being not active at all in regards to uh, making decreases in CO2 emissions. However, we compare this to now and we see that both of these countries are uh, putting forward or uh, their stance in coming closer to the global consensus of uh, 
reductions in CO2 emissions as well within this century. Uh, during, well, we, in the case of Japan, during the Hatoyama administration, we did make some quite ambitious goals. However, since the Fukushima disaster, there has not been much of a, shall we say, forward-looking perspective in regards to this, including the current administration. And so unfortunately, we are seeing within the administration and even to an extent or in a certain way amongst the population in Japan as well, the belief that, well, if we are not to be operating nuclear power plants at the moment, it is unavoidable that we will have somewhat of a temporary increase in CO2 emissions for the, the due term. And if we look, for example, at the goals which the Japanese government has set in regards to its uh, decrease in emissions, actually the standard which they are using to compare to this is 2013. So this is at the time when Japan's emissions of CO2 were at their peak as a result of the aftermath of the disaster as well. So, And the goals which are being set are only a very small decrease from the 2013 levels, which is meaning that this is a very well passive or negative stance which we are seeing from the current administration. When we look at the traditional concepts or the fundamental concepts of economic growth, it was long held that in order to pursue, in order to implement economic growth, you do need to have significant uh, consumption of energy. However, I believe this is a very much or fundamentally a 20th century kind of way of looking at the situation. If we look now at concepts of economic growth, we need to be looking at economic growth while at the same time having significant decreases in the amount of energy being consumed as well. And we are really seeing new technology also proving that this is the way to be going forward in this century. And if we also were to be seeing these energy needs being met more and more by renewable energies, this would also lead to, for example, uh, there being no longer a need for international conflict over issues such as resources, gas and oil and so on as well. This would also contribute to that respect. Uh, there is a US scholar or expert called Amory Lovins who I've had the chance to meet on several occasions. And in his recent book which was published, he actually uh, sets forward that he believes that such a world could be created by the 2050s or soon after. And I very much share this opinion. A Siegfried Nittle writing for the Austrian newspaper, The Standard. Yeah. Uh, you talked about social movement and uh, f uh, founding a new party via social movement. But I, think, <coughs> but I think in Japan, it's necessary to have m five members of, of a parliament to found a party. I think uh, normally, in, in, in what I learned in Japan is social movement people and par party members uh, in, in, um, in, the up, in the lower house or upper house, they have a very different kind of thinkle, thinking. Basic, uh, basic, basic uh, nani, uh, uh, grassroots people, they think different from member of parliaments. How to bring these groups together? This is something I am really thinking very seriously about every day. Actually. However, if we look at past experience in Japan, we can, for example, take the example of uh, pollution or public pollution issues, and we see actually the labor movements or the labor unions were not actually taking a very central role in that movement. And the reason for this, of course, is that the companies which many of the labor union uh, or members would be working for was actually the companies who are involved in contributing to or creating these pollution accidents and so on. And in the case of the nuclear power plant or the movement against nuclear power plants as well, we also see, unfortunately, because of the interests of the electricity workers unions and so on as well, labor unions not taking a very direct uh, role within the movement. So the lesson I believe that we have learned from past experience in Japan is that the interests or the labor movements, the labor unions and what they are working for is not always a match with the interests of the public movements who are focusing on the lives of the citizens or the everyday situation. And so in that respect, when we look at such environmental issues, we see actually social or citizens' movement are perhaps much more sensitive to these issues than traditionally labor unions may have been. It is also the case for issues if we look at pension issues, economic disparity, or also issues being faced by youth. We see that these grassroots movements are perhaps taking much more of a lead or more active in these issues as well. And so if we take the uh, idea, or as you mentioned, and which I also do believe exists about the gap between what's happening within the diet or diet members and the grassroots movement, I believe that one of the things that can be done is, well, looking at having more politicians who come from this kind of background, having more people within the diet who are also concerned about these same issues, which are the main issues at the heart of these citizens' movements or social movements as well. And so if there are more politicians who are coming from within these movements or also coming from looking at these 
issues which are seen as the most important by such movements, this could perhaps work towards bridging that gap and having some kind of a new step within Japanese politics. And I believe if such people can come from within these movements, this can lead to more cooperation and the kind of collaboration that is needed to go beyond the traditional or the current opposition parties restructuring and so on, shall we say, as was mentioned in the previous question. And it's for this reason that I also have great uh, expectations of the current movements that we're seeing in Japan as well. If we look at next year, the voting age will be changed to 18 years old, and I think it will be, we will look at what change this might make as younger voters are voting for people who are working more on issues that are much closer to their hearts or who they feel are much closer to representing their interests, how they can have more confidence in as well. And for this reason, I am paying great attention and have great expectations for the current movements. My name is Kono from Weekly Gender Japan. Uh, yes, I would like to ask a question about Okinawa and about the relocation of the Futenma Air Base. Uh, we've seen the situation over the past month with the negotiations and so on. Uh, when we look at during the Democratic Party's time during the Hatoyama and also your own administration, there were various alternatives to construction at Henoko which were being considered at the time. I would like to ask what kind of strong alternatives to Henoko existed within what you were considering at the time and why this was not able to be realized. Um, particularly during uh, Prime Minister Hatoyama's time or the Hatoyama administration, I believe there was uh, significant efforts being put in place to consider other alternatives, uh, particularly looking at other locations within Japan, other domestic locations for uh, establishment of a place which could fulfill the functions of the Futenma base. Uh, however, as a result, of course, there was not an easy agreement to be made within local communities in other places which could be proposed as uh, alternatives and so for this reason it was not able to have a uh, relocation within Japan or domestic relocation as well and it was in relation to this where Prime Minister Hatoyama actually took responsibility for this and stepped down as Prime Minister. Following this during my term there was of course some debate and consideration about this however to uh, uh, summarize, uh, it was not easy to be able to find an alternative location within Japan, an alternative domestic location for uh, relocation of the Futema functions, and so for this reason it uh, did not go forward. Thank you. Changing topics again, I mean, as a European, I'm curious to ask to a Japanese politician and former prime minister. Europe now is coping with the migrant crisis. So hundreds of thousands of people are leaving Middle East and Africa trying to reach European shores and Europe at all costs. So how do you see from here this uh, problem? And uh, do you think that Japan should be open to accept uh, more than uh, 11 refugees every year, like did uh, last year? Of course, as you say, Japan has for many years been very cautious about its acceptance, not only of refugees, but also of foreign workers as well, shall we say. And I am of the opinion that Japan should be accepting more of these people. However, of course, this is an issue which would lead to various considerations domestically within Japan. There would be various issues which would arise as a result. So we need to have full consideration of what kind of issues this might be to recognize these to decide how Japan would deal with this and through this process also look at accepting more people. Within the current debate around the security bills, I've had the opportunity to speak on several occasions with Mr. Itadaki Kenji, who has been involved in various United Nations PKO activities and so on. And through these discussions and also looking at the current situation or the security situation internationally as well, we are also seeing that the the form of conflicts which are occurring within the world today is very different to the traditional concepts of war or conflict as well, where before we would see, you know, uh, international conflicts, conflicts between different countries, inter-country conflicts. However, now we are seeing internal issues, we are seeing terrorism, we are seeing many different changes in the fundamental idea of conflict and what this means, what this is bringing as well. So I believe we also need to have a full re-examination in order to update policy in alignment with that. <laughs> 